Thanks everyone for joining us. Just letting you know that we're going to allow a minute or so for Zoom to uh, accommodate everybody into the, into the room. Um, so just sit tight and we'll be starting in about a minute. Thank you. Okay, everybody, we're going to give it about another 20 seconds before we start just to uh, give Zoom time to let everybody into the room, because sometimes that takes a minute or so. So just sit tight for a few more seconds and we'll get started. Okay, hopefully that's been long enough. We will go ahead and get started now. Thank you everyone for joining us. Welcome to the latest Duke Media Briefing on the calls to change society emanating from protests across America. I'm Gregory Phillips with Duke Communications and I'm moderating this panel. We have three Duke scholars with us today to discuss policing and reform of the criminal justice system. I'll introduce our speakers and get the discussion started and then we'll open it up to questions. We are recording this briefing and that recording will be sent to everyone who registered. Thanks to those reporters who already submitted questions. Uh, during this discussion, those of you joining us on Zoom can also submit questions via the Q&A window as they occur to you. And there will be an opportunity for everybody to ask questions out loud in a few minutes. So now I'll introduce our, uh, our faculty. With us today is Brandon Garrett. He's a law professor at Duke whose areas of research include criminal justice policy. And he contributed recommendations to a report issued Wednesday by a coalition of law school professors proposing first steps towards police reform. Good morning, Brandon. Morning. Uh, we also have Daryl Miller. He is also a law professor at Duke. He studies, among other things, uh, civil rights, constitutional law, and state and local government law. He also co-directs Duke's Center for Firearms Policy. Good morning for you. Good morning. And Laura Edwards is a professor of history at Duke, and her areas of expertise include the legal history of policing and the history of the law in the 19th century. Good morning to you. Good morning. Okay, so Professor Garrett, I'd like to start with you. As we look at the killing of unarmed black men by police, how much of the problem is due to policies regarding the use of force and how much is down to the way those policies are applied in practice? I see the two as deeply connected. Police in America have incredibly broad discretion to use deadly force. And about a thousand people are killed each year by police, making police violence a leading cause of death for black men in particular. So this is a public health and civil rights crisis. It's also a legal and cultural crisis. Uh, the law is not particularly constraining of police. The Supreme Court has said that officers basically can react to potentially deadly situations based on what seems reasonable in the moment. And that shoot from the hip approach has led to black suspects far more likely to be killed by police. Officers lack of familiarity with the community, their cognitive biases may cause them to jump to deadly and wrong conclusions. George Floyd po no, posed no risk to anyone when killed in the neck hold in Minneapolis. Tamir Rice had a toy gun when he was shot in Cleveland and we could go on and on. There are hundreds and thousands of these cases over the, over the last decade and the decades before. Police policies, however, can do a lot more than the bare minimum that the constitution requires. They can define what force is reasonable, but officers need more than just a new toolkit and policy on paper. Training is important, so is supervision, accountability, internal discipline incentives and culture. And that's why the conversation has turned from beyond paper policies to the entire structure of policing in this country, uh, which does need to be radically changed. Uh, our Center for Science and Justice at Duke does work on use of force policy, but we see this as not just a legal, but also an institutional and cultural problem. And uh, a joint statement by our center with others, including collaborators on the American Law Institute principles, set this out in this changing the law to change policing statement that we issued yesterday. But we need to think more broadly about what is public safety, what do we need police for, and when is it appropriate to have armed people intervene in our society? Absolutely. Thank you for that. Um, Professor Miller, I'd like to move on to you. Uh, as Professor Garrett just mentioned here, we need to rethink uh, the police. And currently, we've got this uh, defund the police movement um, that's gaining a lot of traction. Can you uh, talk about that movement, what it means, and what direction you think that effort should take? Sure. Right, thanks. Uh, thanks a lot. And um, again, I'm Daryl Miller from uh, Duke Law School. The uh, 
the question really about defund the police is about this this what the slogan means and uh, unfortunately i think it's uh, got so much meaning that it really doesn't work effectively as a slogan so defund the police i think at its most um, useful and constructive uh, is a request to totally rethink how we do policing in america who does it uh, with what kind of tools uh, where, under what circumstances, it, it's about redeploying resources uh, to other uh, non-policing functions that are also social services, like jobs training, like fair housing, like uh, uh, substance abuse programs, uh, like domestic violence uh, prevention work. Um, that is one aspect of the defund the police um, uh, spectrum. Uh, that I think this term means. Uh, unfortunately, I think that because it's a slogan uh, and easily understood, it's easily misunderstood to mean abolish the police. Uh, and to the extent that defund the police means abolish the police, I really think that that's going to be detrimental to uh, Black Lives Matter and Black lives in general uh, for this reason. Because I believe that it will empower and embolden vigilantes uh, people that will engage in armed self-help uh, in the way that led to the deaths of Trayvon Martin 10 years ago uh, and Ahmaud Arbery just this year. Um, the issue about abolishing the police or disestablishing the police is that it has the potential to disestablish or abolish the one policing organization that is politically accountable. If somebody designates himself as an armed neighborhood watchman and stops me. Uh, I don't have any control over that person. I can't make them wear body cameras. Uh, I can't make them engage in de-escalation techniques. I can't make them uh, take a, a test on de-bias training. I can't do any of that kind of thing. I don't even know who to file a report with. Uh, whereas with a police force that is a taxpayer uh, supported, that is politically accountable, I have some control as a voter and a taxpayer over what kind of force is being used in my community. Gotcha, thank you very much. Um, Professor Edwards, I'd like to move on to you now. So you know, we've been talking about uh, what the police are for, what the purpose is. Can you tell us how policing was conceived in the constitution and why that concept is especially relevant right now? Yeah, and two points here. Um, you know, at the time of the nation's founding, policing as a term was used broadly to refer to governing. So it's more like governing at that point. And so it referred to the government's broad powers over all matters relating to the public order, to the health, safety, welfare of people. And by that, they meant all the people, actually. So it was about resolving a wide range of problems and injustices. And everybody had responsibility for policing in this sense, this very broad sense. And everybody could draw on police powers as well. And that was particularly important for people who were unequal, who were at the margins of society, who could then call on government and their authority to back them in various conflicts and problems in their lives. And we've tended to forget all that today. And so we think of policing now as only related to police forces of uniformed officers, but that didn't exist in the 18th and early 19th century. And we think policing only refers to crime, but that was not what policing was about then. It was about this broader sense. Um, so this vision then of policing, the second point here, which I think is really important, is it was written into our constitutional order. So the US Constitution gave authority over policing to states, and then states rooted police powers in the people and delegated authority to local governments because that way people could participate actively in this policing and governing of their communities. And the language is really clear here. So according to the 1776 North Carolina Constitution, and this is a quote, the people of the state ought to have the sole and exclusive right of regulating the internal government and police thereof. So this phrasing then, which links policing to the people is still there in North Carolina's constitution and actually in other state constitutions as well. And this link bears directly on our situation today. It's not just this antiquated thing. Um, people have the constitutional authority to hold modern day police forces accountable, but they also have more than that. Um, they have the right to actually hold and define how government uses police powers and to what ends, right? This is their responsibility, this is their right. 
And this is important because police powers are actually about more than crime and criminals. They're about resolving conflicts. They're also about addressing the problems of people in trouble. They're about rectifying deep-seated injustices. Um, so it's shifting attention here to those issues really is also about policing in its original sense. And so to conclude here, the past tells us that policing is not an either or issue. It's not like you can do it or not do it. It's actually about how we do it. And that is really part of our constitutional order. Absolutely. Thank you very much um, <clears throat> to all of our professors here for those opening remarks. Um, we're going we're gonna to move it on to uh, open it up to questions now. As I mentioned, you can, uh, those of you joining us on Zoom can submit questions via the Q&A window, or you can also uh, raise your hand in Zoom. If you're joining us uh, by phone, you can raise your hand by pressing star nine. Um, and while we wait for some more questions to come in, um, Professor Miller, I'd like to come back to you. Um, yeah, I gather that uh, your work, you found that over time, the, the kind of local policies that we're starting to see calls for, when they are changed en masse, it can actually end up influencing how the Constitution views policing. Could you talk about that a little bit? Uh, absolutely. So uh, one of the interesting things about the ways in which um, policy changes at the local level can eventually translate into uh, constitutional law uh, happened uh, just uh, in the, the 20th century. Um, as um, historians, including uh, Laura Edwards, my colleague at Duke would know, it used to be that as a matter of uh, the common law, uh, that you could actually uh, kill a felon who was trying to escape. You could shoot them in the back to keep them from escaping. Um, that seemed incredibly disproportionate in terms of the use of force. Um, and many uh, police departments in the United States ended up altering their uh, domestic local police practices with regard to use of force to prohibit uh, the killing of a fleeing suspect. Uh, and eventually, uh, it, in a case called uh, Tennessee versus Gardner, uh, that uh, question about whether it was actually constitutional to use that kind of force to kill a fleeing felon went before the Supreme Court. And the Supreme Court, among other things, noted that times had changed, uh, that uh, weapons were far more lethal today than they were uh, when the common law was established. And they also pointed to the fact that many police departments had changed their use of force policies. And as a result, ended up saying that as a Fourth Amendment constitutional matter, it is now uh, unconstitutional to use deadly force uh, unless it's necessary to protect the officers uh, or to protect uh, the public. Gotcha, thank you very much. Um, Professor Garrett, um, related to that, I'd like to ask you about um, liability and accountability um, in the police. Obviously, this is a, a huge issue right now as we look at these, you know, the killings that have taken place, but also how we, we look at reform. How do issues of accountability and liability play into the current debate? Sure, you know, before I became a law professor, I, I sued police for a living, including in police brutality cases. And uh, uh, it's challenging work. Um, it's not just the constitutional standards that, that, that uh, my colleague Daryl has been talking about, uh, but statutory where the courts have said that police benefit from a doctrine called qualified immunity. There are now public calls to abolish this doctrine, which Congress can do. Uh, it's kind of amazing to me, having done this work in the trenches, that, that it's actually like a topic of public concern, which is really important and exciting. It's, um, it's very, very hard to hold police officers liable, even in fatal shootings, even captured on video, even shootings that seem totally unsupported or chokeholds or neckholds or other types of police conduct, because police benefit from another layer of sort of benefit the doubt, uh, benefit of the doubt, sort of reasonableness. What could they do in the circumstances? It was very tense. They have to make split second decisions. That's sort of the tenor of a lot of the reasoning of federal judges uh, following this doctrine of, of, of immunity. Uh, also important though is, is internal accountability within police departments. Uh, so police discipline, police policies matter even though they may just be on paper because if police officers do something that violate their policy, something should happen as part of routine supervision. And we talk all the time about officers that aren't disciplined, not even placed on leave, or officers that are fired for serious conduct and mis mis misconduct, and they're rehired 
at other police departments, like our colleague Ben Gronwald has shown in this article on wandering officers. Uh, so people have talked about the need for certification systems to track officers, uh, where you have officers that are fired from departments for serious conduct, but they go to smaller departments that never heard about what happened at their prior employer. Uh, so there's just a lot that we don't do to track the conduct of police officers. And in other professions, we do this. You know, if you have a, a surgeon and patients are dying one after another on, on the operating table, that surgeon doesn't just get rehired at some other hospital that has no idea what happened at hospital number one, right? You track fatalities carefully, right? There are postmortems. Uh, there are literally postmortems in the medical setting. Uh, and yet in our criminal justice system, terrible accidents or terribly harmful intentional conduct, whether it's purposeful or not, often doesn't get investigated, except maybe in the context of a civil rights lawsuit, which will usually not result in any compensation for the victim and won't lead to longstanding lasting reform. And so that's why people are talking about the need for accountability structures and not just in the courts. Okay, absolutely, thank you. Um, Professor Edwards, that kind of leads me back to this, this historical perspective. I mean, obviously things are, are extremely complicated now, but when we look at um, the past, like how did people handle policing in terms of the keeping order and the managing of conflicts in the past? And I mean, what kind of lessons from that um, might we be able to use in reform now? Yeah, um, it's interesting. The whole field of policing, uh, this is Laura Edwards, um, and the whole field of policing was very different in the early 19th century. So say this were 1810, and we're living in Orange County, North Carolina, where I live, sorry, not Durham County. And I had a problem because my neighbor's cow kept eating my garden. And this is really serious because my garden is about feeding my family. And I've talked to the neighbor and the cow keeps coming into my garden. And then finally we reach an impasse and there's nothing I can do. So I would walk down to the local magistrate and I'd say, hey, look, my neighbor is, this cow is eating my garden. I can't like make him stop. And I don't have the power to do that, but I'm asking the magistrate to step in. The magistrate would say, okay, okay, okay. I have to listen to you because of this concept of policing, which is broad and which is about this keeping community peace, keeping community order, but also rectifying injustices and stepping in on the side of people who can't fend for themselves. So he would call in my neighbor and he'd say, okay, let's sit down and talk about this. And first what he would try to do is diffuse that situation to actually keep the peace, to mediate, and to see if he can make this go away. So he wouldn't walk in with a uniform and a gun and then point the gun at my neighbor and say, hey, I'm here to solve the problem because that's not the way to solve the problem. Um, so the whole feel of this is actually about mediating, about diffusing a conflict, about also understanding who to listen to because you have the knowledge of your neighbors in the community. Um, and then a lot of those cases wouldn't ever become criminal matters. They would be resolved in that way through that kind of mediation. Um, it was much more flexible um, and less rigid, less focused on crime per se and more on mediation. And for me, this actually speaks to some of the broader um, claims and proposals now of shifting resources away from a militarized approach to conflicts into conflict mediation, but also then knowing what these conflicts are. So, you know, a cow in a garden is different than the other side of me with my neighbors who have children that they're not taking care of or poverty down the street or a homeless person. Um, so knowing that and being able to handle that and having the flexibility to handle that is all about policing. And actually people were pretty good about doing that in the 19th century, oddly enough. You would not think so, but they were. Gotcha, thanks very much. <clears throat> yeah, I guess it's easy to look into the past and think that uh, people were simpler and didn't handle things as well as we do now, but I think there's evidence that other times have certainly handled things better than we're doing in the 21st century. Uh, Professor Miller, I'd like to come back to you. You, you mentioned um, about how uh, the constitution changed in the 80s. Um, and then you, know, you also mentioned the, the, the potential for vigilanteism if we were to just go down this road of uh, abolishing the police. Combining those two things, I'm wondering, do you, as we look at um, the momentum towards reform right now, do you expect to see uh, a gradual unfolding on the local level and then whatever is similar in these policies across um, you know, municipalities and states, that coalescing into some sort of federal change? Is that what you think maybe we can expect if reform does take hold? Well, I think we're seeing it uh, already, which is, um, you know, to the extent that some of the demands uh, of activists in the streets over the last uh, few days 
um, are actually percolating uh, to uh, thought leaders, to political leaders. Uh, some of the proposals uh, for police reform uh, that uh, Professor Garrett had, had mentioned and has been really instrumental in, in advancing um, are already uh, being drafted as draft legislation in Congress, uh, abolishing qualified immunity for police officers, um, uh, conditioning funding uh, uh, for a local police on uh, keeping accurate records about use of force or uh, discriminatory policing. Uh, so I think that that's actually uh, happening in, in that way, and as usually does. Um, I think there's another component, uh, though, that uh, we just don't know, um, you know, to the extent that there are truly uh, groups um, that uh, believe that, uh, uh, that police uh, uh, are not needed. Um, they are also active, and um, I, I am... I am doubtful um, that as a nationwide matter, we're going to lead, uh, we're going to see the widespread disestablishment of the police. Uh, but to the extent that, uh, local communities in Minneapolis um, or Seattle uh, want to take some or all of the sort of defund the police uh, rhetoric and actually implement it as policy, uh, they have the ability to do so. Uh, and I just hope that they. Uh, uh, choose uh, wisely when they end up uh, making uh, these demands into policy. Gotcha. Thank you. Um, thank you for that. Uh, Professor Garrett, I'd like to come back to you. As I mentioned in the introduction, uh, you were the co-author of a series of recommendations that were issued yesterday from law school professors across the U.S. Um, regarding first steps towards police reform. I'm wondering if you could tell us a little bit about that document and uh, some of the recommendations that are in it. Sure. Uh... In general, I think we do need to rethink what we need police for and what the structures are for policing agencies. Why do we so often arrest people? Why do we so often place people in jail, which we didn't even just a few decades ago? You know, during COVID, urgent new questions have been asked about why do people end up in jail for petty crimes, largely due to inability to afford cash bail. So if we're talking about funding and defunding the police, should police be debt collectors? We have a recent report from our center showing how one in 12 people in North Carolina have unpaid court debt, and almost 2 million people falling disproportionately on Black and Latinx persons in North Carolina. And so there's a serious, serious problem with race disparity, not just in deadly use of force, but non-fatal shootings, arrests, all sorts of different police encounters. And so this uh, report on steps to change policing deal with the full spectrum of how policing is structured in the United States. We talked, for example, you know, policing agencies are needed in many places for public safety, obviously, but there are a lot of very small police departments which can't possibly follow best practices or have good training. We need to consolidate police departments. We shouldn't have so many tiny departments which can't possibly be well-trained. We don't want private policing. Uh, we need to revise criminal codes and consider decriminalizing low-level offenses. There just shouldn't be policing on certain Topics. We don't need to be arresting people, much less holding them in neck holds for using a $20 counterfeit bill. We need data collection and reporting. Uh, and we need to do something about that data collection and reporting. North Carolina is also an unusual state where, uh, you know, several policing crises ago, and, you know, policing has been at the crisis point in this country for decades. Uh, North Carolina is one of the first states to pass a law that all data on race concerning traffic stops be collected. We've known about gross racial disparities in traffic stops in North Carolina since the late 90s. It hasn't changed the way that police uh, behave. The disparities have continued. And so transparency is important, but there need to be accountability structures so that data is used for something, including to decertify potentially officers who engage in uh, systemic misconduct, to allow special independent investigations and prosecutors for critical incidents. So police aren't just policing their own. Uh, we need to rethink arrests and set standards for arrests. We've seen people during COVID arrested nearby here in North Carolina for failure to appear in court when courts were closed. And why should someone be in jail for failure to appear? Uh, that certainly is a way to ensure that they will be present, but to have people in jail for weeks because they missed a court date for a minor offense when it's a potentially deadly situation with the spread of COVID doesn't make sense. We talk about use of tactical teams, invasive surveillance technologies, the whole range of privacy, force, uh, personal debt, intrusion, uh, First Amendment values. 
speech that we're seeing with crackdowns on protests. So there, there's a lot to talk about in policing. And, uh, and we need both national, state, and local reform. So I hope that this is the kind of big moment that we have needed to finally tackle these major, major structural issues that affect every community in this country. Gotcha, absolutely, thank you. Um, Professor Edwards, uh, obviously as a historian, I'm sure you are um, very familiar with kind of unearthing things that are surprising to people today. Uh, and I think that, you know, the, the, the things that you've said about how policing was um, conceived in the constitution would, would be a surprise to a lot of people. But do you think as, as this debate over reform goes on, that because a lot of people more, most gener more generally in this country uh, would like to say that they adhere to a kind of strict interpretation of the constitution, that there's value in bringing this out um, as part of this particular debate and saying, hey, you know, we do need to um, revisit exactly what policing was for because we've drifted so far away from it. Do you think that can take hold in this debate? I really hope so because policing, it, the, our founding was a very broad and very positive, had very positive connotations actually. Um, and we now associate all these sort of negative connotations to it in the sense that we associate it with police forces that are separate from people and then are enforcing laws and, and trying to root out crime. And it's become a very negative kind of thing. And so when we look in the past, we also look for, we tend to look for direct reference. And so people imagine policing in the past to be simply about militias, but militias were you know, actually organized to address specific threats and were very temporary and then disappeared um, after the threat was gone. Um, or we think of slave patrols and surely slave patrols are actually about policing and it's an example of policing at the behest of those in power. They're using police powers to uphold their vision of the social order. But then ordinary people, marginalized people could also use police powers to address what they saw as the major issues and problems in society. So I think we're missing that piece of it, that historically, constitutionally in our past, police powers did belong to everyone. Um, and everyone had the chance of using those to try to create what they saw as a more just society. Um, and that's really crucial and important because I think it gives a lot of legitimacy, validity, and also grounding to the kinds of claims that people are making today in terms of reforming police forces because policing is about something much broader. Um, and then I think it's also really important because this is connecting ordinary people, marginalized people to the government this is also going to produce more debate, more conflict than about what constitutes the public order. We've got to be comfortable with that. Um, when you have more people participating in what does a good society look like? What constitutes uh, public health and safety? You're gonna have differing opinions and you can't freak out about it. You can't just close off that debate. You gotta listen. And then we have to find ways to work through that. And interestingly, people did that in the past. And I don't know why we can't do that today. I think the inclination of many in power is to close down the debate, but that's not what our past points to. Our past points to a reasoned and engaged uh, listening and working through these problems. It's hard, but we can do it. They did it before. Absolutely, there's a history of it in this country. That is for sure. Um, thank you, uh, every all of our panelists for our answers so far. We are open to questions. So I would remind uh, everybody joining us on Zoom that you can submit questions via the Q&A window or raise your hand um, and we can unmute you so you can ask a question. And again, if you're joining us uh, via cell phone, you can raise your hand by pressing star nine uh, so that we can unmute you. Um, Professor Miller, I'd, I'd like to come back to you. You are also a scholar of civil rights and of gun law and the second amendment. And I'm wondering how those issues could play into this reform debate, because you've already mentioned about that, that um, you know, defunding the police potentially gives rise to this idea of vigilantism or legitimizing it. But obviously, um, you know, Second Amendment gun rights are, are key, you know, to that kind of movement, too. So, I mean, do you see how do you see um, this debate affecting um, the thoughts of issues around the Second Amendment? Right. I mean, it's a really excellent question about the the relationship between the moment we are here and right now and 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 gun rights uh, as well as civil rights and and i think it is expressed by the fact that i had mentioned before um that one of the issues here is um 
how do you make the policing function when it is decentralized um, also accountable? Um, the kind of structures and the kind of legal framework that we have uh, typically makes a sharp distinction between what we might think of as um, a public actor and a private actor. Um, that has something that has evolved uh, over time ever since the uh, reconstruction. Uh, and it really is a challenge when we think about uh, what would it look like uh, if you ended up having self-designated armed patrols that say that they are doing the policing function, uh, but are um, self-appointed, self-directed, um, self-organized in like a neighborhood association. Um, we just haven't really addressed that in a systematic way as a constitutional matter. And, uh, and I think that to the extent that the um, uh, gun rights advocates end up uh, looking at what's happening now as an opportunity to say, well, look, the police here um, are not effective or the police here are untrustworthy or the police here are just not uh, available anymore because they have been abolished, uh, then the law will end up having to address what does it mean to have private groups with arms uh, patrolling the streets. Uh, the second thing, and I'll be very brief about it is, look, the Supreme Court of the United States uh, has, hasn't had and decided a Second Amendment case in about a decade. They have to be seeing this. Um, uh, they're thinking about the Second Amendment and private rights to use uh, lethal arms for self-defense against a backdrop of what is happening with regard to police force uh, and uh, the concentration and accountability of use of force. Um, and so I think uh, that it's going to have an impact when, as I expect, the Supreme Court ends up hearing a Second Amendment case in the next uh, two to five years. Gotcha. Thank you very much. And I'd certainly like to come back to that. Um, I, for now, Professor Garrett, I'd like to come back to you. Um, as we're talking about criminal justice reform, obviously policing is huge. We've also got this issue of um, the over-policing and prosecution of minor crimes. Um, that is overflowing the prison system and clogging the court system and causing lots of people to end up, as you mentioned earlier, incarcerated for, for very minor crimes. How much of a factor do you think that should be in uh, reform and how much do you expect that to be part of the conversation? I expect that it will continue to be a really important part of the conversation. And, um, and to have that conversation, we need to not just talk about police, we need to be talking about our prosecutors and our judges. In the past, um, there wasn't much in the way of politics surrounding the election of prosecutors. It was incredibly rare for a district attorney running for a re-election to even be contested to have an opponent. Um, and uh, in recent years, we've seen a little bit more of that. We've seen contested races. We've seen spending on district attorney elections and people running with reform agendas, saying that we'd like to change the way prosecution is done. Similarly, we've seen major, major bail reform efforts and efforts by courts, by judges, but also by lawmakers and others to rethink how, how bail is done. You know, why should people, uh, and the bulk of our jail, jail population is, is made up of people uh, in jail because they can't afford cash bail. And what does you know, a bail bondsman do to protect pu public safety? What does paying 10% of a cash bail amount to a bonds person do to assure uh, safety? Uh, I should say I, I have a, a role in this work. I'm the court appointed monitor in the Harris County monitorship a federal consent decree, the first of its kind in the country, to wholly revamp the way that misdemeanor bail is done in Houston, you know, the third largest metropolitan area, third largest county in the country, where in the past you had tens of thousands of people for the most minor offenses uh, in the jail every year. And that's dramatically changed as a result of this consent decree. Uh, but building a new system for re rethinking how uh, pretrial works uh, takes a lot of work, and that's, that's our job in that case. Uh, but, you know, we need to be looking at both the upper end and the lower end of the system. So not just deadly use of force or the death penalty, but non-deadly encounters, arrests for minor offenses, and also low-level sentencing. 
uh, including, for example, traffic tickets. In North Carolina, there are over a million people who have lost their driver's license for failure to pay traffic tickets that they couldn't afford. And there's only the most rudimentary inquiry into whether you can actually afford to pay traffic debt. It's fairly automatic that if you don't appear in court or you can't pay the traffic ticket, you lose your license. And it's disproportionately black and Latinx persons in North Carolina. Uh, it's a one in seven adults in this state and North Carolina is not alone. And so we impose these just egregious consequences for the most minor activity, speeding, a broken taillight. And whether it's losing your, your license, uh, whether it's an arrest, uh, th these things also build in terms of the debt from the court fines and fees or the time in jail that you have to spend if you are then arrested for driving with a revoked license and you can't pay the cash bail and then do you lose your job, lose your, your custody of your kids, uh, stop taking your medication because you can't get it. You know, how many jails ask people and carefully inquire to make sure that they don't keep someone in for so many days that they lose their Medicaid, lose their healthcare permanently perhaps. So you know, these questions had not been asked in the past and we need to be asking these questions of our district attorneys, of our judges, of our hearing officers, magistrates, our court clerks, everyone in this criminal legal system. Absolutely, uh, a huge issue and as you say, it touches just about every aspect of society. Um, Professor Edwards, I'd like to um, come back to you for a moment. You mentioned earlier, you know, examples of um, how uh, a pr past approaches to policing that could be a useful model today. Do you have any other examples of that? Because I think that's kind of a fascinating way to, to look at the problem today as we kind of search for solutions. Yes, and this is Laura Edwards. Um, you know, today we think that all of our approaches to like social welfare, um, public health, that this is something new, that people didn't care about those things in the past, or they just ignored them somehow, or maybe we don't think about it at all. But a lot of policing in the late 18th, early 19th century involved the things that we would call social welfare today. So for instance, um, in local cases, court records, you had a lot of instances of wives bringing um, complaints against abusive husbands. So essentially they were using the term of policing to police abusive husbands. They were bringing domestic violence cases. We don't think that's possible in the early 19th century, but it was given this broad notion of policing, of maintaining peace, safety, health of people in the community, which meant that even though wives were subordinated to their husbands, they could still appeal to the concept of policing to bring in government to help them and back them when they were in trouble and even to the point of disciplining you know, husbands who had considerable authority over wives. Um, even as, and this is get back to this, this notion of conflicts within this concept of policing, even as you had slave patrols, which were upholding white supremacy and slavery, you also had cases where enslaved people would complain about very egregious abuses, physical abuses that they endured by masters. And in some instances, local officials would step in because it was conceived that these extreme abuses were actually endangering the public order. Now, what's interesting about this is that it also moves um, the complaints of ordinary people, of those in the margins, into the center of what constitutes the public order. So they're putting limits on you know, the excess of violence used by individuals against subordinated people like wives and enslaved people. But then they're also saying that, well, you know, as general public policy, we just don't support um, abusive husbands, that there are limits here. Husbands have authority, but they can't use it in this way. So there's this ongoing conversation that happens as a result of this broad notion of policing that allows people on the margins a place in it. So even as we're upholding you know, husband's authority, as we're upholding white supremacy and slavery, there are also these spaces that people use to moderate that, to change that. Um, and it also put those things at the center of the public order. And we've forgotten that. And all those cases can be surprising to us today because we imagine that only recently could people on the margins use the legal system. But actually policing allowed them from a very early time in our nation's history to access the legal system. Even those people without rights could appeal to the public order, their place in the public order through this broad concept of policing. 
Um, so it's surprising, but I feel like it's a very important precedent for what's happening today and also extends this conversation beyond simply claiming rights like First Amendment rights or whatever that way you can simply say I'm part of the public order and the public order really shouldn't be supporting this kind of behavior beyond your individual rights or anything else. Um, and that's really a very broad, powerful statement. Okay, thank you very much. Um, sorry, I was muted there for a second, hence the silence. Uh, we've got about five minutes left here, so I would remind everybody that you can uh, raise your hand um, on Zoom if you'd like to ask a question or submit it via the Q&A. And if you're joining us via cell phone, you can raise your hand by pressing star nine. Um, Professor Miller, I'd like to come back to you. You mentioned a couple of times how um, cases you know, rising to the Supreme Court is obviously how we're gonna see a kind of widespread change at the federal level. Are there any, you know, you mentioned obviously cases pertaining to the Second Amendment. I'm wondering, are there any cases involving police brutality or police actions that are currently working their way through the system or cases that you would expect to come before the Supreme Court that could have a major, be a major factor in the reform of policing as it happened in the 80s, as you mentioned earlier? Uh, that's a really good question. Uh, honestly, I, uh, I mean, there's routinely uh, cases of, of various kinds that uh, uh, go through the system that have to do with police behavior, typically Fourth Amendment use of force cases. Um, the past uh, has been that the Supreme Court has often, under this sort of doctrine of qualified immunity, ended up uh, protecting uh, the police officer um, from uh, civil liability uh, when the police officer has used excessive force. Um, uh, but uh, couldn't have reasonably known at the time that they um, uh, that they were violating the Constitution, which is an extremely lax uh, standard and very police protective. Um, those kinds of cases are constantly uh, being um, uh, decided going up for cert uh, before the Supreme Court. I don't know of a specific kind of case. Uh, Professor Garrett might uh, be following some uh, more on, on on that dimension, but I think to the extent that we really do see um, a groundswell of changing qualified immunity, which is a core component of police misconduct litigation on the civil side, if we see uh, a uh, a a statute that ends up abolishing qualified immunity, um, as there are two proposals before uh, Congress right now. Um, I think within uh, the first year or two, we'll have to have some kind of Supreme Court decision about what that means. Um, one of the paradoxes, and it gets a little bit into the weeds, one of the paradoxes is that qualified immunity applies both to local police, but it also applies to federal police. Um, uh, and the one is governed by a statute, uh, the other is just governed by what the Supreme Court has said over time about litigation against the president, against the attorney general, against other senior executive officials. Um, and that will all have to be sorted out if in the future we see the abolition of qualified immunity uh, as a legislative matter. Understood, thank you very much. Um, we're getting close to uh, 10, 15 now. So um, before I wrap it up, um, I'd like to thank everybody for joining us, but I'm gonna go around to each of our panelists. And although this is obviously a huge and intractable issue and it's gonna take years or decades uh, probably before we can really see exactly what's happening here. Um, I'd like to ask each of you for, um, uh, and apologies if it sounds oversimplified, but one thing that you would like to see happen today, you would like to see said today, you would like to see highlighted today um, as we take the next kind of small step in, in this debate. Uh, so, uh, Professor Garrett, I'd like to start with you. Obviously, you're part of that report that came out yesterday with a number of recommendations, but what's one thing that you would like to see happen today, if it could? I'd like to see comprehensive state-level police reform legislation and criminal justice reform legislation in states like North Carolina. It's not enough. You've heard states here and there say, we're going to pass something to track officer certification or we're going to ban uh, the use of chokeholds, we need, we need comprehensive reform. There is a very detailed federal bill that'll be a start too, but a lot of policing obviously happens at the state and local level. And so we need to be looking to our local elected leaders to make, to make deep change. Absolutely, thank you for that concrete 
recommendation. Professor Edwards, you have the long lens. Historically, what's one thing that you would love to see happen today? So I would like to see us think about the protesters and also their demands is actually what is part of our original constitutional order and a return to that. And our, what we see now with the way that police forces are acting and what they've become as what is aberrant, what is actually a move away from the original constitutional compact. Absolutely, thank you. Professor Miller, we'll close with you. And amongst all of this that's going on, what's one thing that you'd love to see happen today? Well, I mean, I'll just preface this by saying my professional and personal life has been punctuated uh, by events like this. Uh, Malice Green was killed by the police when I was 10. Uh, Rodney King was beat by the LA police when I was in college. Uh, Amadou Diallo was uh, shot by New York police officers uh, when I was in law school. Uh, it seems like um, every single sort of benchmark of my personal professional life um, has been marked by a, a death like this. And the fact that we are at a moment, I think, uh, where people really do recognize, not only nationally, but internationally, uh, that this is a problem, that this is a problem uh, that needs to be addressed, that America is not living up to its best um, uh, uh, version of itself, um, and that some kind of real, substantial, data-driven changes are available and can be implemented uh, uh, soon, uh, I hope that people will recognize uh, the magnitude of this moment. Absolutely. Thank you. And I can't think of a more powerful uh, point to end on. So I would like to thank you, everybody, for joining us. Thanks to our panelists, Daryl Miller, Brandon Garrett, Laura Edwards. Uh, thank you to um, everybody who joined us on Zoom. Uh, if you'd like to be included on the advisory for future briefings, we're holding these at least weekly. Please do email dukenews at duke.edu. In the meantime, please stay well, stay safe, and have a great day. Thank you all very much.